renewable electric supply, how to deal with electricity and sustainable fuels. Uh, we have uh, uh, in recent times quite a lot of developments uh, regarding the Green Deal objectives. The agreement on the climate law definitely is game changer. Now it is very clear that by 2030, we should achieve at least 55% less uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the EU and 2050 uh, be carbon neutral. So it is very clear uh, uh, obligation and it's legal obligation. It's not any more, well, very well meant intention, but it is a law. Then we also have a very encouraging news that uh, Eurobeat Barometer found out that climate change is a bigger preoccupation even than COVID. So if I would have been asked, I would be, well, giving different opinion at this stage because COVID takes everybody's mind. But no, people really care that climate uh, target should be achieved. Uh, we have seen also very interesting developments in some of the member countries, like in Austria, there is a law being proposed by a governing coalition, supported by also part of opposition, to be having by 2030 100% supply of renewable electricity. So it's a lot of events, but uh, it's definitely a huge task. And today mm -hmm. we will start with uh, uh, Ronnie Bellmans, professor at uh, KU Leuven, uh, head of uh, uh, Energyville. Uh, he is also author of the study uh, that is what you could find on our, our web page and also policy brief about these issues. Uh, we have uh, the fantastic discussion. Uh, we have uh, Giles Dixon, Chief Executive Officer of Wind Europe, and Francisco Bochel, who leads the work on innovation for electrification from IRENA. And we will go through the issues and really to discuss. Uh, it's also true that we join uh, in, uh, to, and discuss today in the preparation or expectations of Fit for 55 uh, package. And that unfortunately prevented Alexander Tomczak to make a concluding remarks because it seems that, uh, well, uh, the finalization of this package is by far more difficult than everybody would be expected. And if there will be leaks, I would say to be careful with the leaks because it seems that some things will be decided in the college meeting only. Um, for introduction of the subject, why we came to this idea to, to really to discuss this issue, I pass the floor to Christopher Jones. Uh, Professor Jones, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andres. Um, we're really actually very happy to ha be having this, uh, this discussion because the, the question of the adequacy of renewable electricity supply is, is really, really important. And I'm not entirely convinced that the Commission has been living up to its own um, arguments in terms of energy sector integration by ensuring that a robust analysis of the future availability of renewable electricity underpins policy making. And it's terribly, terribly important. Um, because at the end of the day, ensuring that we have enough renewable electricity for electrification is the easy bit. And that's hard enough. If you see with the coal phase out, the nuclear phase out, that uh, the increase in renewable electricity in these regions are, is very unlikely, or if not impossible, to keep up with the um, increase in demand for electricity, for renewable electricity. Um, and as a consequence, there'll be very significant amounts of new gas-fired generation, for example, in Belgium, uh, which from a climate perspective is, is not, well, okay, it is what it is. Um, but, but that, in a way, is the easy bit, because that's the existing demand. And then on top of that, we have huge amount of incre incremental uh, demand coming online. Um, Energy-intensive industry, in particular, refining and chemicals. Um, I heard comments from um, a very senior executive of BSF about the amount of electricity that will be required for one uh, chemical cracker. Um, and the numbers are 
absolutely staggering about the amount of energy that one will need. Obviously, renewable, uh, renewable electricity for vehicles is extremely important. Um, unless we have sufficient incremental renewable electricity for all the electric vehicles that we put on the road, um, the question of additionality comes up already there. You increase the demand for electricity by pushing the demand towards electrification rather than um, uh, fossil fuels. Um, and the only consequence is that the demand for electricity goes up rather than additional production of, of renewable electricity goes up. The only consequence is you're making the climate worse because um, all you're doing is you're taking natural gas, you're turning it into um, electricity, and then you're burning it into hydrogen, for example. Um, so um, by using a vector, electricity instead of using the fossil fuel directly you will actually increase the amount of um, GHG on the planet um, so it's terribly important that um, these policies pushing electrification which is um, vehicles in terms of buildings into hydrogen if the renew if the renewable electricity um, supply it doesn't follow you're making the situation worse not better um, so that applies to vehicles, that applies to buildings, and that applies to hydrogen. So the question of renewable electricity adequacy, both on a time basis and on an absolute basis, are vital if the EU is going to get this um, decarbonisation policy right, um, which gets you right into the question of additionality. And I don't know, but I suspect is that this is puzzling the Commission, and I'm sure we'll talk about this a little later, the question of additionality. Um, so obviously this debate has two, much, two sides, the question of will there be enough renewable electricity? One is making sure that your policies are aligned with the amount of renewable electricity that actually will be available in order to ensure that member states' objectives, but not just targets, targets, real action is sufficient to meet this curve and is sufficient to meet our demand. So uh, that is the key issue that we'll be discussing today and I'll pass back now to Andres. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, so, Ronnie, uh, so um, uh, you, you really have now a chance to present the main conclusion on the study and also of your thinking about these issues. Ronnie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andres. Thank you, Christopher, for the uh introduction and uh, I'm, I'm quite honored to be here. Uh, it's a very intriguing subject and I'm quite happy that uh, some specialists of uh, the input side on renewables are here with us to discuss it further because it's it has been an intriguing development in writing this paper. We, we started that six months ago without any real knowing where we're heading for. And the idea was we see so many applications for electrification. We see so many challenges coming along that has to be really put forward and seen to be bringing together all the renewable energy. We see an awful lot of debate on green hydrogen all over the place. And then uh, an humble engineer as I am, starts to think, do the numbers add up? And where do the numbers adding up cross each other? We have the very, very, and I, I must appreciate it very much, very intriguing and stimulating ideas of onshore, offshore PV developments. Gigawatts are being foreseen. At the other side, I see the rise of demand and I see adding up green hydrogen. And my question was, together with uh, Piero dos Reis and together with uh, Peter Vingeroot, does it match? Is the steep uphill climb of renewable energy capable of filling all the gaps and all the holes which are digged elsewhere in transport, in heating, in industrial use, in producing green hydrogen? So it's a simple question. And 
we thought it would be a simple answer, but it wasn't. And what we found as a title after it and discussing with, with Andres and with, with Christopher and, and other people at, at, the, at the VSR, there is a competition for wind and sun. Electrification and sustainable fuels both are looking at the wind and the sun to get the input for doing their job. And what should be the priority? So this is the real, the real subject. And then I turn as a engineer, which I am proud to be, to my laws of thermodynamics. And the first law is an easy one, conservation of energy. So there is no problem. There cannot be any energy problem because energy doesn't disappear. It may appear if you have nuclear energy, but disappearing, it doesn't. But we call it exergy, but the second law of thermodynamics says, every time you change the shape of energy, you deteriorate the quality, its quality. You deteriorate its usefulness to produce work. So you should not change the appearance of energy. Then you increase what we call entropy. So whenever you have electricity and the both big flows of renewable energy, wind and solar, both deliver electricity, it's always inefficient to change its shape to something else if you want to do something with it. So whenever you have electricity, and this is the wonderful thing of renewables, wind and sun, they produce electricity, they produce the best energy shape there is. So that engineering says, use it as it is, period. And if you change it for, to something else and then change it back to electricity, don't do it if you don't have to. It's as easy as to say goodbye. As I say, we engineers are rather simple people. And what surprised me and positively surprised me is last year, Communication 299, Powering a Climate Neutral Economy, so a strategy for system integration, this communication has translated the laws of thermodynamics into legal settlement. A circular energy system, energy first, energy conservation, always the best. Whatever you don't have to use, you should not use. Then accelerate the electrification of energy demand, building on a large renewable based power system. Again, this is fully in agreement with the laws of thermodynamics. If you have electricity, then use it as electricity. This is always the most efficient way of doing things. And if one and two don't work, then promote renewable and low carbon fuels, including hydrogen, for hard to decarbonize sectors. You can use biofuels and biogas. They are limited in their availability. You can use green hydrogen, electrolyzes by green power, and you can have in a transitional phase other sources of low carbon hydrogen, blue turquoise. You can use CO2 capturing, and you can try to produce synthetic fuels, most of it from hydrogen. So ladies and gentlemen, what you see here is a sequence. And our question was, is this sequence, what does this sequence mean? What can we do when to get this sequence done in the most effective way? And then we go, a rush for electrons. How to best use wind and sun. It doesn't interfere in a more circular energy system with energy first, renewables don't come in. And then the key issue, the best way, if you could use every kilowatt hour from renewable electricity as electricity, do so. Don't, do, don't do it otherwise. So the first question is, 
do we have enough renewable electricity to fulfill point two before going to point three? And then in point three, where do we need renewable electricity? You need renewable electricity, not for biofuels, but you, know, you need some of the renewable electricity for pyrolysis. So 10, 15% of the energy for producing low carbon uh, hydrogen from uh, methane, natural gas. If you going to use electricity for green hydrogen, you need for Electro for producing one unit, one energy unit of hydrogen, you use something like 1.3 units of electricity. So this is a very high use. And if you go to synthetic fuels, you even need more renewable energy. So if you want to use your renewable energy in an effective way, go to the orange part, electrification, and then see what is left to do the next things with sequence as is indicated here. What can be electrified? What is the demand for electricity over the years to come? Ladies and gentlemen, the first things first things first, we have already 2,850 terawatt hours of electricity supply today in EU 27. This means that we at least should try to fully decarbonize the supply of that 2,850 terawatt hours. Just for your information, this study, which is very high level, supposes that the energy services, the demand for, for driving, the demand for heating, uh, the, the number of houses stays remains the same, that there is no increase in the demand. Otherwise, things become a very major exercise in modeling, which is needed. But here we try to have the basics as correct as possible. So first thing, try to uh, make that 2,850 terawatt hours green. What are new demands? Cars. All of the, there's roughly 3,300 terawatt hours of petroleum used for cars and trucks, and we can decarbonize them by electrifying them. And ladies and gentlemen, this is far more effective and efficient than trying to use hydrogen. If you use hydrogen for driving a car, you need three times as much green electricity for driving the same distance roughly. And if you then go into heating buildings and, and renovation after renovations, again, electrification can do the job. It's eight times better than using hydrogen, starting from green electricity and, uh, and using it in a condensing boiler. When looking at industry, all low and medium temperature heat can be delivered electrically. And as Christopher said, some of the chemical uh, systems, some of the chem chem uh, chemical processes, like cracking, will use immense amount of electricity. Also, if you look at steel making, there's a lot of electricity going to be needed directly or then as feedstock for hydrogen. And another point we have mentioned but not really calculated is a demand by data centers that will grow immensely over the 10 years to come. So the question is, can PV on and offshore wind deliver sufficient electricity to do all these jobs? And then what is left to produce green hydrogen? So we made a very easy uh, and it's all Excel, there's no big modeling behind it. We do that big modeling uh, together with the uh, Florence School of Regulation and also at Energyville, but this is the easy way. And you look at the, here, you see at the, uh, the, the, the demand, 
the electricity demand, the uh, <clears throat> In, you see the, the existing demand, which is in yellow, that, uh, how it can be decarbonized. And then you see the, the demand for cars, for trucks, and for heat pumps. And if you add all those things, you see the blue line. So you have the present demand. We don't assume any growing electricity demand in the already electrified things. We assume a introduction of electric trucks and electric cars and we assume a renovation wave and a active and, and heating using heat pumps by 2050 so we assume that by 2050 all transport on land being trucks and electric vehicles electric cars plus all heating by heat pumps is electrified and should be supplied by green electricity. If you would not electrify everything, for instance, in trucks, and having those trucks operating by, for instance, hydrogen, you triple the demand for green electricity. So then the disequilibrium is even worse. So what you see that by before 2041, 2042, there is no green electricity left to doing anything else than the three targets we set here. Road transport, heating of buildings, and a greening of the present electricity demand. We did not include here the demand for data centers. We did not include anything in industry, which is more than today. For instance, if you look at green steel, uh, electric steel, or the, uh, the electric crackers. But even if you look only at those simple, and at this moment, technically already perfectly electrifiable things, you don't get a match before 2042. And what we took as numbers, as input uh, for PV, there for PV and for sun, we took what the uh, the people from wind and sun put in their papers and what Irina puts in their papers. So we are really looking at up to date and I hope to hear more, but I think these are already very challenging and that's what we see. So ladies and gentlemen, what does this mean? As before you are there, if you would introduce an electrolyzer into the grid and use electricity, even greening it by a contract, by a PPA, it means that you take away green electricity from more efficient technologies that can, at a lower cost, decarbonize uh, applications, which are easier to decarbonize than going to the route of hydrogen produced here locally. Is there no need for hydrogen? Of course there is. There is massive need for hydrogen. And I took here the, the figures of Agora report in 2000, uh, of this February this year. There's one thing that surely is in uh, great demand for hydrogen is the production for synthetic fuels, aviation and navigation. If you look at the present demand, you have roughly 1,000 for something more than 1,000 terawatt hours of fuel going in there. If we have to produce that and replace it by hydrogen, we need roughly 1,400 terawatt hours. And if you want to use other more high level fuels, it's we need more than 1,500 terawatt hours of green electricity to produce these e-fuels, at least. High temperature heat in industry, again, we will need fuels there. We need them for feedstock, and we need them for new industrial processes. And I was very happy and very, it was very interesting for me to see how Agora looks at it. Agora says that the demand for hydrogen will remain, I would say, roughly the same from 2020 to 2050. And all of that hydrogen at the end of the day has to be carbon neutral. So what they see is you have refineries 
but that fades out. You have the demand for hydrogen in ammonia production, which remains something less, but roughly the same. The demand for methanol remains the same, but you see two things which are growing. Steel making will be demanding a lot of hydrogen and the recycling of chemical plastics. For me, this was an eye opener. I probably you knew it, but all of that should be supplied by green electricity. But there is no green electricity left in continental Europe. We have to use it for other things. So we probably need to import this. And then I wanted to draw some conclusions and there I am I, really grateful to uh, Andrew's uh, Peebles who, who learned me to, to write those things as an engineer is not, not always easy. And but it's clear that we need a significant increase in the ambition for renewable electricity. And the very ambitious things that we read in the reports on onshore, offshore wind and PV are needed. Otherwise, we won't be able to supply all the electricity needed for decarbonizing the present use, decarbonizing the road transport, the cars, and the extremely ambitious renovation wave. If we don't succeed in having those renovation waves, we will even need more electricity to heat houses. And going the route via hydrogen is always even requiring more green electricity. The use of renewable electricity has to be targeted following the energy system integration strategy. So electrification first. Electrify what can be electrified. Otherwise, far more renewables are needed for the same CO2 results. So if you don't electrify cars, you need more green electricity if you go the non-direct electric way. At least for the next two decades and beyond, because as I said, we omitted a number of electricity applications, use other routes to decarbonize industrial hydrogen use, probably blue, even if possible in the next decade, going to turquoise, so the pyrolysis route. The so-called hard to abate sectors in industry and long distance transport applications <clears throat> uh, require green, green strategy for periods with low wind and, and also for periods with low wind and sun, so-called so uh, also including the Dunkelflaute. We have to focus in the next two decades to come on demonstration and development. We can do this first two decades with the first decade certainly without them, and we have to look for new things in R&D. There we still have time. We will need to import both renewable electricity, requiring major new power lines to be constructed to Africa, North Africa, but also to the, the UK and, 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 and in the North Sea, uh, and renewable energy based on molecules from outside Europe the EU27. And hydrogen use will dramatically change due to different applications. We need a different grid for hydrogen. The hydrogen grid will be rather limited with respect to its distance, but will be very important to bring it to that new industry where it's going to be used. Thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. And look at this last picture. This is the energy transition. In reality, this was an old coal mine and is now Energyville where we are. So the energy transition is working and glad to be part of it. Chairman, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you, Rone. Well, what, what we definitely can't expect that these issues will come within PIT for 55 uh, package. So it is, it goes beyond what I assume now is commission discussing. Uh, 
but I will first ask Jael. So, what do you think about it? Well, basically, you should be very happy. More renewable electricity, more demand for wind, etc. How the thinking that was presented by Ronnie actually influ could influence the plans of wind industry, or you where you agree with Ronnie, and where you would disagree from your point of view? Thank you very much indeed, Andres, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can I, on behalf of all the other speakers and behalf of all of the audience, I am sure, thank and congratulate Ronnie for that outstanding presentation. There are very few people in Europe who can not only command the attention of an audience on these issues for a full 25 minutes, but keep us on the end of our seats, following every word and every piece of impeccable logic that you are giving to us. Thank you very much indeed, Ronnie. Um, as you say, Andres, um, I agree with much of what uh, Ronnie has said, not with 100% of it, but with much of it. Um, perhaps it would be useful to begin by setting out the wind industry's view on how much we can produce by 2030 and how much we think we can produce by 2050. Uh, give the supply side perspective. Uh, on this, because this is crucial to Ronnie's analysis. So today we have 180 gigawatts of wind energy capacity in the EU, and wind is providing 16% of all of the electricity that we consume. The European Commission scenarios for 2050 say that wind should be 50% of all of our electricity by 2050. Now, of course, the share of electricity in the energy mix is going to increase hugely. Uh, Ronnie, your report says it's 21% today. The Commission want us to have at least 57% direct electricity in the energy mix by 2050 and another 18% electricity fueling renewable hydrogen and other synthetic fuels. So that's 75% of the energy mix uh, based on a feedstock of electricity by 2050 compared to 21% today. What that means in terms of the expansion of wind energy capacity in the EU between now and 2050 is huge. As I say, we have 180 gigawatts today. The commission scenarios see 1,300 gigawatts by 2050 of which 300 would be offshore and 1,000 would be onshore. What about from now to 2030? Well, uh, the Commission want wind capacity to rise from 180 gigawatts today to 433 gigawatts by 2030. That assumes the higher renewable energy target, the 38, 40% renewable energy target, which we're gonna get with the Fit for 55 package. Uh, that requires the wind industry and society collectively to build 27 gigawatts of new wind farms every year between now and 2030. How much are we expecting to build over the next few years? Answer, only 15 gigawatts a year over each of the next five years. So we are today only building just over half the volumes of new wind that we need to be building just to meet the 2030 targets, let alone getting us to 2050. What are the constraints? What are the bottlenecks here? The number one problem is permitting. The permitting rules and procedures for new wind farms are too complex. It is too difficult. It takes too much time to get permits. There are not enough staff working in the permitting authorities. These sound like very simple problems, but they are very real and they are at the core of today's exam question. If we don't sort out these permitting issues, um, we can all pack up and go home. Now, uh, the EU has brought in new rules on permitting now, new deadlines, a two-year deadline. It came into force last week. Permitting authorities have to take a final decision on all permit applications within two years of initial application. It's one year only for a repairing project of an existing wind farm. Those rules need to be ruthlessly enforced by the European 
Commission. The Commission also needs to be helping member states on how technically they can simplify their permitting rules and procedures. It's easier said than done. This is not a public opinion issue. Public opinion polls consistently show 75% support for the expansion of onshore wind across Europe, in every country. And those support levels are the same, if not higher, when you ask people who already live close to onshore wind farms. So we have to sort out permitting, then we have to sort out the grids. Today, we are investing only 40 billion euros a year across the whole of the EU in our transmission and distribution grid infrastructure uh, to deliver this huge increase in volumes of renewable electricity, volumes of electricity in total, and this increased share of electricity in the energy mix, we need to be investing 80 billion euros a year already this decade in our transmission and distribution networks. Most of that money needs to be spent on the distribution networks, on the low and medium voltage uh, networks, but a significant amount also on the high voltage transmission networks. Um, I fully agree with you, Ronnie, that um, we have to use direct electrification for everything that can be electrified directly in the energy system, whether it's in transport, heating, or industrial processes. Firstly, as you've said, Ronnie, it makes far more sense to use the electrons for direct electrification than it does to convert them into molecules uh, and try and decarbonize things with renewable hydrogen because that incurs energy losses. In addition to what you've said, Ronnie, on the demand side, and I think one of your slides said this quite clearly, in fact, it's always going to be more energy efficient and therefore cheaper to decarbonize something directly with electricity than it is uh, to try and decarbonize it with renewable hydrogen. I think for uh, motor vehicles, your uh, figures were, it's three times more efficient. Uh, for, for heating, it's also three times more efficient, as, as you said, Ronnie. Um, now, one point that, Ronnie, you didn't mention, and I don't know whether you want me to bring this into the debate or not. We're talking only about renewable volumes here. We're not talking at all about the reliability, the stability of those renewable volumes. We're not talking about the so-called intermittency issue. We tend to prefer to call it variability. I mean, we can go into that issue, Andrews, if you want us to, or we can just leave that issue and focus on the volumes. Which would you prefer? I think it's good to, to mention it because it is, it is reality. It's not yeah. something that is just theoretical. And if we come with such a strategies, we need to take this factor into account. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me just say one minute on the so-called intermittency issue. And the point is this. Wind and solar are becoming less intermittent, less variable than they used to be. It is becoming easier and cheaper to manage their variability. It's becoming easier and cheaper to integrate variable renewables in the energy system. Because first, we have much more demand response than we used to have, and we're going to have much more of it. So that's balancing the variable supply with more variable demand. Second, we have more smart grids, we have more flexibility uh, in the management of the electricity network. That is very good. We have more storage coming online. And finally, we have more flexibility and more stability on the supply side, both for wind and solar. So our capacity factors are rising all the time for uh, new onshore wind, the capacity factors are now between 30 and 40% in Europe. For offshore wind, they are 50%. And our ability to ramp up and ramp down our output, depending on the demands in the electricity system, are much greater than they used to be. To give you just one example, Ireland is now able to manage 70% variable renewables in its electricity system day by day. Okay, And other countries can, can copy that model. Okay, uh, a few final observations back to Ronnie's main um, uh, set of arguments. There's some good news out there, which is a real push from the demand side for more renewables. And I know the focus is on the supply side of this discussion, 
but it helps us so much because it drives investment decisions when the end users are knocking on your door saying, please build a wind farm. Yeah. Uh, energy intensive industries used not to like wind. Even three or four years ago, they didn't like us because we were expensive. We were intermittent. We were messing up the whole energy system. Now they are literally knocking on our door saying, please give us more wind. How close to our factories can you build your wind farms? Let's connect via uh, a power purchase agreement or some other means. BASF have just signed a framework agreement with RWE. Two gigawatts of offshore wind, please, as soon as possible. Other players in the chemical sector, the steel sector are knocking on our door. We have more and more PPAs that we're signing directly with large industrial corporate uh, off takers of uh, electricity, including, of course, the data centers that uh, Ronnie mentioned. Um, one very live example, many of you will have seen uh, this week's announcement from uh, Volvo, Daimler, Scania and MAN that they want to build a network of 1,700 uh, charging points for Europe's electric trucks of the future. They made that announcement on Monday. Monday evening, they were already talking to us about how we could ensure that it's wind energy powering those uh, charging points. They're knocking on our door, okay? Uh, so that is very positive. Um, one final observation, if I may, we must have a level playing field in the tax treatment of gas and electricity because we need that to drive the electrification of domestic heating in particular. You're absolutely right, Ronnie. It makes no sense to try and decarbonize heating uh, uh, and other household uh, energy uses via hydrogen. No sense whatsoever, or in commercial buildings. But we've got to sort out the tax treatment because today um, consumers have no incentive. They have a positive disincentive to switching from a gas boiler to an electric. Heat pump. It's great that the Commission want to support a huge expansion of heat pumps in the Fit for 55 package, but that just won't happen if they don't sort out the tax issue uh, and ensure that gas and electricity are taxed uh, on a level playing field. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Giles. Uh, Francisco uh, actually is an engineer, by, well, at least he has an engineering background. It's not necessarily electrical, it's mechanic. Uh, but um, it's, it's also Francisco's job to look on this exactly issues, Ronnie, that you, you brought forward. So, so I, we are very, very excited to hear from Francisco what he thinks about issues raised by Ronnie, because I assume that you'd spend days and nights on these issues. Francisco, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Andres, and thank you very much, Ronnie, also for uh, the excellent presentation. Yes, I am a mechanical engineer by background, so I agree with Ronnie. I mean, the, the loss of thermodynamics are my bread and butter also, and physics, I mean, it's very difficult to bypass physics laws as human laws. So I, I think the presentation was spot on and, and really raising very uh, key issues. I, I would like to make and also a very good point from uh, Giles, and I, I basically agree with most of what has been uh, said. Maybe a few, maybe quickly, six, seven observations I, I have uh, very quickly. The first one is on, on uh, energy generation, so renewable deployment. So from our analysis in IRENA, we did actually in 2018 the analysis for the European Commission, where we foresee that by 2030, we should have uh, in the EU, just the EU, not the whole Europe, but just the EU uh, countries, around uh, 1,500 terawatt hours per year of wind and solar PV. It was done using a Plexus uh, model with all the constraints of the European uh, electricity system, taking into account the plans of ENSOE for infrastructure and so on, validated by the European Commission. And actually, it was also used for the, at that time, the negotiations that end up with the 27% target at that time for the European Commission. It was seen as uh, ambitious at that time. Now it's looked as very conservative nowadays, which is very happy, and we are now revising that, but let's say in terms of the, the technical constraints to have such a renewable energy capacity in Europe, there was not really any bottleneck, no issues about land uh, use, not issues about, uh, let's say, infrastructure needs and so on. So the issues were very much about the soft balance. I think what Giles was mentioning again is about uh, permitting, 
is about accelerating electrical infrastructure investments. No, we hear from NSOE that uh, we need at least uh, 40 to 45 uh, gigawatts of additional um, uh, interconnection capacity, cross-border interconnection capacity in Europe by uh, 2025. Uh, and those plans need to be accelerated uh, uh, very fast. Uh, also, the leveling play field, playing field, but permitting. I, I, I hear also what uh, Giles is saying about uh, the case of wind. Even in the end use sector, it's the same thing. I just uh, as an anecdote, I have a friend here in there in Bonn who is uh, thinking about uh, re, uh, refurbishing his house and uh, renovating his heating system and moving from gas boiler to a heat pump. And he was telling me, Francisco, I want a PV plus a heat pumps. I will go for that. I met him during the weekend and he said, Francisco, I quit on the idea of heat pumps because I investigated and just to get the permit to drill the holes for um, the, the heat pump and so on is so difficult in Germany that Look, Francisco, I really don't want that. I don't need that. So I, I will continue with the gas well. So th that, that's the reality. So we have our projections. We, I think yesterday we heard in the news, you no, know, uh, electric, the electric industry saying 15 million heat pumps can be installed in Europe, no problem with the grid. And yes, that, that's, a, that's on paper the reality, but we need also the conducive enabling regulatory frameworks to, uh, and, and uh, permitting and so that really helps to materialize these uh, plans. So uh, also the national uh, uh, climate and energy plans from our analysis, they don't really reflect, let's say the, the potential of all the European countries uh, in terms of renewable uh, generation capacity. They are really limited and not considering, for example, beef electrification really to the full extent. So there is also a lack of compatibility between, let's say, the EU plans and the national climate and energy plans. But let's say technically, it seems like there is no really issue to me that is more about the soft part. So this is energy. Now, the second point is about uh, adequacy. I think we have that, and adequacy is not about uh, uh, energy, it's about capacity, it's about peak uh, demand. And then we have another problem, another issue, and is, I think Ronnie mentioned it. So we will have all these cars, all these trucks, all these heat pumps, all the electrolyzers with new load profiles connected to the grid. Also what Giles has mentioned about the flexibility issues. So we need an installed capacity, not only to meet the energy demand, but also to meet the peak demand, the adequacy issue that Christopher was mentioning before. And for that is where Irene is very strong. We need what we call a smart electrification approach. And what, are, what does it mean? That we need to manage these load profiles in a way that they don't become a constraint to the electricity grid, but even a solution or additional flexibility sources for the electricity grid. So this is something that is still do not get enough attention in the policy making debate. We have had events with policymakers on electric trucks, for example, electric cars. And the discussion is very much, of course, on deploying the infrastructure, deploying the charging points, etc. but not so much on how we will manage these loads. And also the disconnection between the energy authorities, the transport authorities, the building and industry authorities. So these plans need to be uh, compatible and they need uh, to work uh, together. So the second point is capacity or adequacy. The third point is I fully agree with Ronnie on the first, well, any efficiency first and second, direct electrification. That is the way to go. Again, the example of the uh, trucks is clear. Five years ago in Irina, no one pushed for electric trucks. Everyone was saying because of the range, et cetera, we go for hydrogen trucks. Last year we had an event, everyone was moving to electric trucks because of total cost of ownership, because of gains in efficiency. Just to give you an idea, just in Europe uh, by 2050, uh, we expect that more than 50% 50 per, uh, 50 of total energy consumed, consumed by road freight should come from electricity, should be supplied by electricity. Yeah, But if we see that in service units, so by kilometer per ton of cargo uh, transport, uh, electricity 
has a 70% share, so higher than on energy demand. This is also because not only on energy supply is more efficiency, energy consumption, but also the drivetrain for the trucks is more efficient, the electric drivetrain, than the, the combustion or even the fuel cell uh, drivetrain. So definitely a direct electrification first, and where it's not possible to directly electrify, then consider uh, synthetic fuels or the indirect uh, electrification uh, route. The fourth one, the fourth observation again is infrastructure. So these grids, and I think I wanted to make the same point that Giles did, Giles, uh, did about the importance of grids, especially distribution grids. And this is an issue not only about investments, but it's also about public acceptance and impact on the citizen. The city of Hamburg, for example, they made an analysis on what would it take to the distribution grid in Hamburg to have 60,000 electric vehicles in 2025. And they said, look, if we go for an uncontrolled electrification, so everyone charging in the night at the same time, we would need to invest around 20 million euros in distribution grids, basically cables, transformers, switch gears, etc. Yeah? But if we go with a smart electrification, uh, adapting this profile, through digital technologies to the needs of the grid, we will need only 2 million euros investment. So a ratio of one to 10. But that's not a big problem. We can get the money, yeah, maybe. But the issue is that we will, can you imagine the city of Hamburg, big parts of the city of Hamburg with a construction work, you know, uh, uh, opening holes for the cabling, overhead cable and so on for many months in the city. I mean, this would be really a chaos. So this is the other impact that needs to be taken into account. So this is reinforcing the point of a, a smart electrification and infrastructure. And that brings me to my fifth point that maybe has not been mentioned yet, and is the role of digitalization and digital technologies. When we think about infrastructure, we also need to bring on board the policymakers from the digital infrastructure perspective and the digital uh, industry as well, because they hold the key to make this transition smarter and more optimized. And we are seeing now many interesting solutions which are piloted, but not scale up in terms of smart charging of vehicles, in terms of smart charging of uh, trucks, in terms of using heat pumps as flexibility solutions, but we need to scale up these digital uh, solutions and infrastructure. So we see digital technologies to play a critical role in this uh, transition. Now, um, the sixth one is about the, at a certain point, let's say, we will anyway possibly need the synthetic fuels, and then we may start having this constraint, and it's what Ronnie was mentioning also. Okay, should we import electrons or should we import um, synthetic or molecules in the form of hydrogen, but most likely hydrogen derivatives like ammonia or methanol? Yeah. And for that, we is, is one point is the, the, the infrastructure for the, the ports, the pipelines, and so on. But the other, looking into the policy making uh, discussion in Europe, and I think Christopher mentioned it before, is the discussion about carbon leakage and additionality. There is now in the European Commission this the debate about uh, carbon or discussion about carbon border adjustment uh, mechanisms uh, and also the revision of the EU uh, ETS. No? And what we see in IRENA is that these are very interesting ideas, but there is still a lot of homework to be done in the sense that these mechanisms like carbon adjustment, like carbon border adjust mechanisms would need a set of standards to, to calculate the carbon footprint from different products uh, using different inputs for their production. So electricity, uh, carbon sourcing, et cetera that need to be uh, harmonized, not only in Europe, but internationally, because this would be about global trade, yeah? and it need to be reliable and credible and endorsed by major economies. And we are already seeing, well, Europe is discussing this, a pushback from other countries like China, India, even US saying, okay, well, we are listening to these ideas, but we need to, be, uh, to discuss this further. So there is still, uh, quite some homework when we start discussing, okay, so locally we cannot source all of these molecules and electrons we need to import, and we need to take into account carbon leakage. There is still quite some homework <laughs> to be done there. So on the positive side, anyway, we again, we don't see really technical restrictions 
is more about the uh, legal frameworks, regulatory frameworks, soft uh, issues, leveling the playing field, uh, etc. And uh, also, uh, there are interesting developments that we didn't have in our analysis of 2018. We are doing it for the new analysis for Euro. For example, the, the new interesting prospects about offshore wind. This was something that we didn't fully consider in 2018, and now it's more clear. The efficiency gains due to direct electrification, I think that need to be uh, uh, computed now in our new uh, calculations, etc. cetera. Uh, so there are some uh, positive also uh, developments. Uh, but uh, I think the, the key message from uh, Ronnie's and Piero's uh, paper is clear. Uh, we need to accelerate the deployment of renewables. Direct electrification is certainly the first option before uh, indirect electrification. And when we need indirect electrification, issues around uh, additionality, carbon leakage needs to be seriously considered. And we still have quite some work, uh, homework to do there. I hope that was useful. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Francisco. Ronnie, what uh, do you would like to have uh, make any comment? What were you heard from Giles and uh, and Francisco to defend yourself, or perhaps it created a new idea for you where you need now to look more in the depths? Okay, uh, I don't think I have to defend myself a lot. Uh, I'm thanking uh, Giles and Francisco for their. The valuable comments. Uh, I learned an awful lot. I think that uh, a lot of what they were saying is, is confirming what 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 we had tried to to address. So, uh, as Francesco is saying, I'm a, he's a mechanical engineer. I'm a humble power engineer. So, uh, electrification first. I could be judged to be a bit uh, preoccupied in a certain direction, but. Uh, of course, I'm happy that uh, we finally are, are winning the game. Uh, this is not happening with the football these days in Belgium, but uh, you can't win them all. Uh, anyway, but that's, that's not the story. Uh, what Giles was saying is very intriguing to me that uh, 15 gigawatt per year is an immense task and we, we need to go to 27. Just for your information, the, the, the numbers we used as a basis for 2030 are the numbers uh, based on the national energy and climate uh, policy, political plans. So this was, I know that most of the countries they already put forward uh, some hopeful things. If I look at my own country, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it will be hard to be to, to make them. So uh, we thought they were already ambitious. So that's where we, we put them. Uh, and I, I, th I also heard, and this is new for me, that uh, I knew that this was happening in the construction and innovation uh, area. But uh, the Giles was pointing to the lack of uh, human skills, human capital in doing things. I think that we underestimate more and more the uh, human capital uh, problem in this energy transition. I hear people screaming from the renovation and the construction area. I hear people screaming that there is no knowledge about batteries. I hear people screaming that there is no knowledge about repair and maintenance of electric vehicles. I hear people screaming that uh, the, peop the person that comes into your house to, uh, to, to the maintenance of your boiler is not the one who is going to install a heat pump. So this is a very critical thing and there is no money to buy them. Okay, it takes six years to pick in secondary school uh, and to educate a technician. It takes five years to get a master of engineering. So there is, even if we now have a, a, a girl or a boy at 12 years, he will not be, he or she will not be there for this 2030 target to help us. And this is from my point of view, an underestimated thing in the whole thing. And again, it pops up here for me at an unexpected place, but Everywhere, every every presentation I give these days, people say to me, human capital. And we are not talking blue color, white color, orange color, or orange color, whatever you like. We're talking everywhere. This is for me scary, very scary. Uh, looking at the, the further comments, uh, we, we meet, so we meet 
permits are a, a really a, ve a very thing and and something giles and that you may, may help me there we we did a at at, at energyville energy encounters and there the one of the things was that the permits are coming so slow that by the time you get the permit, the technology has already moved to the next step. And you have to re uh, do to, 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 to go again for a permit because it's not 2.3 megawatt anymore as the standard wind turbine, but it's 3.1. So uh, that's so you I see you're nodding. That's I think we should take note of that. This is the permitting is one thing to get a permit is okay, but you, have, you need a permit for the present technology and not for the previous one. Then uh, the less variability is very good. And I want I always want to point, and also looking at Francisco, we, we have to point that the new demand that we're getting is electric vehicles, trucks, and heat pumps. All three of them are very easy to control in their demand. And that's something really unique in the, in the three applications we are talking about, cars, trucks, and heat pumps, all of them have intrinsic storage. And heat pumps, the storage is called heat in the building, in the building mass. And then I come back to the, one of the comments of Francisco, which I really appreciate and, and, and uh, I fully agree with it, that we have to look at the plans, not only at European level, between building, transport, industry applications, and look at it as a whole. Uh, one of the things that we have, one of the groups that we have at Energyville is on renovation of buildings. And you have to take from the beginning the mass of the building as part of it, because it stores the heat. And it gives you the, the transient, the, the dynamic demand of the heat pump. You, so storage is well hidden. There is storage in the system. And the new things that are coming along are storing. And if we then have a much better controlled input, we will get there. Storage, it was also talked about in synthetic fuels. I think synthetic fuels are important. And also they are called in for storage Dunkelflaute, as they call it in German. That's one of those, uh, the second word that the Germans introduced in the energy system, Energiewende, and then, and then now Dunkelflaute. But I think there is another storage which is more important, is a strategic storage. And all of those molecules will be needed for strategic storage. We now also have three months of petroleum stored. There will be something equivalent. And that storage will then also be fe feasible to be used for Dunkelflaute. So, We'll need those molecules, a pot of them, somewhere in the harbor of Rotterdam and Antwerp to supply Europe for one or two months if something happens with the supply. But synthetic fuels are important for several applications. Uh, other, uh, <clears throat> the, the less variability and the smart grids were mentioned. Yes, and I think, and now I'm looking at the people of the Florence School of Regulation, regulation we need that regulation to be far more pushing towards that flexibility in that distribution grid. I'm looking, for instance, at tariffs. And uh, one of my hobbies for five years now is to be chairman of the board of the regulator in Flanders. And we introduced a rather dynamic uh, capacity tariff where you don't charge anymore, that we now have roughly 30% of the bill is based on capacity and people putting, incentivizing people to make the use of the grid, not by peaking. And looking at, for instance, at the heat pump, a heat pump is a marvelous thing for a capacity tariff. It has a very low power with a lot of energy. We can charge a vehicle at slow speed during the night. So we need to have that tariffs digitized, also something Francesco mentioned, because you need continuous measurements and tariffs that make an efficient use of the grid 
feasible. Avoiding the Hamburg problem of uh, digging the streets, but again, it's really a regulation part which is so critical that it's overlooked. So there, there is a challenge for the uh, for the uh, the regulators to to be much more looking at peak demand, peak power, and try to bring it down. Infrastructure. Infrastructure on uh, there is a very major challenge, and I don't know. And I want to sympathize with Giles. Uh, you have to connect the wind farms, but you have to also link the grid, which is going to be happening in the sea, to the grid, which is on land. And what I miss from the European Commission is a coherent plan between the deployment of offshore wind and the grid, say, in the next few hundred kilometers deep in Europe. There is no plan, to my knowledge but I may not have all the data with me, but to my knowledge, there is no plan. And I'm the honorary chairman of the board of ELIA and ELIA has half of the North Sea coast of continental Europe in hand, the other half is with the tenant. So there is no plan, there is no coherent plan between those two. So I think that what we see and uh, what we see, and, and of course this paper, this study is a very, high level study, it's about energy, it's not about adequacy. But adequacy is a challenge. But I do think that we should not look to adequacy as we've done before. If I look, uh, you were said, saying in Ireland 70% of the, you can have 70% of the renewables in the system, I know that. They have now installed uh, what is called inertia uh, drivers in, into the system. So there are solutions to that. There are new solutions and technology will solve those problems. If I look into the 50 Hertz, 50 Hertz east of Germany grid, which is uh, uh, which, which we acquired uh, from Alia, this grid is the grid with most of the renewables in the, in the control zone in the whole of Europe. So it can work. It is a challenge. It's a challenge when there is an eclipse. That's a real challenge. 20 minutes, no solar, great, fun, it's done. But we have to look at that. And, and therefore, we also have to look at uh, the uh, TSOs and to the grid codes. The grid codes are far too conservative. And I'm pleading here for a proactive regulation, both in the distribution grid and at the TSO level to write me the grid code for the system that we saw here with 70% renewable electricity by 2030. And we have to have that grid code in 2023. That's the only thing we need. So yeah, it's going to be very interesting. I thank you very much for your comments. I noted down as I, as I showed you an awful lot of them, but we have to go for the direct notification. We have to see where we need those molecules and let them then use to be the most efficient way. And if it's import, import them with the correct molecule, as was said, uh, with ammonia, with methanol, or even higher e-fuels. It's gonna be a fun thing, but I'm pretty sure that we have all the solutions for 2030. It's going to be a very hard working. There's not going to be anything new coming out of the lab before 2030 that's going to be an industry. But from 2030 to 2040, we'll see new things. And from beyond 2040, we don't know what we're going to see yet. Christopher, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, sorry, Ronnie. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's floor is yours. Yeah, uh, Christopher, uh, I, I, you, you have a chance to really to listen. What is your take? And uh, as we are moving to the concluding part, uh, what question you would put to Francisco and Giles? Okay, uh, thanks, Andres. Um, I find it encouraging and extremely worrying, actually. And perhaps I'll, I'll just add a, a few questions. 
and perhaps um, Giles and Francesco can, can choose between it. Um, so um, the numbers that Giles uh, mentioned in relation to the need for future supply, wind energy, 27 gigawatts a year between now and 2030. And presently the member states are on 15. Um, so I'm, I'll start with the worrying bit. Um, so presumably Giles, in 2021, 2022, 2023, we'll still be at 15. And personally, I doubt we're going to be much more at 2024 and 2025, because by the time member states have redone their national energy climate plans, um, got themselves sorted out, et cetera, et cetera, which means a shortfall of 12 gigawatts a year until 2025, best case scenario, which means 2025 to 2030, they now need 39 gigawatts a year. Hmm. 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 Um, so what's the commission going to do in its fit for 55? Because um, now on the basis of what you were saying, we need to do something radically different compared to what we've been doing in the past if we want to actually do this. And so the EU, not necessarily the commission, it's not fair to put the blame and all the responsibility or whatever at the commission, the EU has to up its game very significantly, enormously, because the, the status quo is not going to deliver what we have today. And I would guess that that was, you, you mentioned planning, um, but, but I, I would take your encouraging words with a huge bag of salt about um, enthusiasm of EU citizens for windmills. Um, I'm sure everybody is very enthusiastic about them, but not next to me. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear more from that. Um, and secondly, um, what else should the commission be doing in the Fit for 55? Because th there needs to be a complete change in the, the, the target commission is no longer an option. Just, just setting targets and hope everything will be okay is probably not an option. So what, what should happen? Um, I'd, I'd also like to ask Ronnie and um, Francesco, well, everybody about additionality, because this is something that, that puzzles, troubles me. Because if, so we, we all know the, the argument on additionality that if you um, build an electrolyzer and just use capture renewable electricity that would otherwise be used for direct electrification and shift the demand curve for electricity upwards so that the only consequence is additional coal or gas fire generation is produced, which is then used for electrification. The indirect consequence is that you are, instead of using um, natural gas to produce gray hydrogen, you're producing natural gas to produce electricity to produce gray, uh, um, well, to replace the gray hydrogen, which is actually worse from a climate perspective than not doing it at all. Um, and the only things I can work out on how to do additionality is either direct lines from a windmill to a hydrogen plant, or only use the hydrogen plant during periods of otherwise curtailment, or have a PPA from a new uh, wind farm, which doesn't count to a member state's renewables target. Um, but how to? But that makes it very difficult to actually do an electrolyzer. So that that was the, the second question. Um, thirdly, I'd also be really interested to hear from Francesco um, what is happening internationally on this issue is is what we're doing in Europe being really reflected internationally or are we really doing it on our own um, and the last question to Giles you said tax equivalents between gas and electricity um, are, are you talking about the um, actual the tax the VAT or are you talking about renewable electricity charges that are placed on electricity um, so I think those are the key questions that I would have um, Andres yeah, thank you, Christopher. Uh, I will start with Francisco. So you can pick any question what Christopher put or any comment on what Ronnie said in the second uh, uh, intervention. Francisco. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andres, and thank you, Christopher, for the questions. So uh, very quickly on the additionality one, I think what is also needed is a, a comprehensive and coherent framework uh, a, a set of standards and certification mechanisms to ensure 
that uh, the uh, electricity used by these electrolyzers is coming from renewable energy sources because it would be very difficult to always have cat captive uh, or uh, PPAs with uh, a renewable energy uh, power plant. And this is actually what is being discussed. I'm, we are looking forward also to the revision of the uh, Senelec standard, I think it's the NEN 16395, I think, is the one that uh, addressed the guarantee of origins for renewable electricity. And now the commission has given the mandate to send Senelec to expand that also to hydrogen derivatives. So guarantee of origins also for hydrogen and its derivatives. And this has been working as we speak at the moment. And it seems to be that by the end of the year or early next year, there will be a revised standard for that. However, there are many questions around that standards and the additionality issue that are very, very uh, fair, let's say, to, uh, to discuss. But let's say there is uh, some action on, on that front. On the global perspective, the electrification trend is happening actually in basically everywhere. And uh, the drivers are, of course, the, now the low cost of renewable electricity and also um, the the decarbonization and sustainable energy uh, agenda. And what is very interesting is that especially how countries, some countries with abundant resources are seeing a big business opportunity around this electrification, particularly of course, in the case of uh, green hydrogen and its commodities. We are seeing the developments in Saudi Arabia, in Australia, in Chile, in Morocco, uh, even in Colombia, with big plans around producing hydrogen, but also green ammonia um, to export uh, to different uh, countries. So th these issues are uh, happening uh, globally, and it seems to be that the issue about global trade of these commodities will, let's say, become more and more pressing over the next uh, few years. So on the positive side, renewable low cost electricity is pushing all of all of this. But on the other hand, then the new new challenges emerge. But the, the hope is that we will live up to address those uh, challenges. And maybe one last point I want to endorse also one coming from Ronnie on the role of grid codes. Uh, I fully agree uh, with that. We are working actually on a topic of that. And we will contact you, Ron, for your insight. There are three key aspects of, of grid codes I would like to mention, and is the role of uh, new technologies like grid uh, forming inverters and technologies that need to be to address in the grid codes. But also now we have new assets connected to the grid that we didn't have a few years ago, like utility scale batteries, like electric vehicles with B2G uh, uh, functionality or capabilities. And uh, these countries are now uh, considering what is the best option to address that in grid codes. And the third point is that grid codes are also important because the system operators sometimes are, let's say, conservative with good reasons because they are responsible for supplying electricity and that the lights stay on. So if they see any potential risk that put in peril, they are defensive and say, look, create your plans or whatever, but look guys, <laughs> at the end, if something happens, I am responsible. And these grid codes are a very strong instrument to give the confidence to system operators that they can continue to operate the system aligned with the political uh, objectives of such uh, high shares of variable renewals and new loads while keeping the lights on. So grid codes, I agree with Ron, very important. Thank you, Giles. Uh, Christopher, quite a lot of questions addressed to you. So pick on which ones you would like. I will try to answer all of Christopher's questions. Before I do, the two important ones from Ronnie I'd like to tackle, skills and human capital. I talked earlier about the lack of skilled staff in public permitting authorities, and that this is a bottleneck to the permitting of new wind and solar. But there are much wider issues on human capital, Ronnie, as you've said, the actual people who are going to build all these wind farms and solar parks and operate them. Um, there are 300,000 people working in wind energy in Europe today. Uh, the relatively modest expansion of wind energy that's envisaged in the National Energy and Climate Plans for 2030, and they envisage us building 18 gigawatts a year of new wind, uh, so slightly higher than the 15 we're currently building, 
um, that would entail an increase in headcount from 300 to 450,000 in wind in Europe by uh, 2050. And we are finding it very difficult today to find the skilled, qualified technicians and engineers and other workers that we need. Um, two sources of hope here. The offshore oil and gas industry is a very fertile place for uh, uh, skills uh, and uh, human capital transfer into offshore wind. And we are actively training coal miners uh, to become wind farm operatives. It takes us six months to retrain them. And we're doing this um, uh, with the sport of uh, just transition. Uh, we've started it in Romania. We'll be starting it in Poland very soon. Ronnie, your question about permits and technology developments. This is a problem, yes. Some countries do not allow you to change the technology spec that was in your original permit application. So if it's taken five years to get your permit through, uh, you end up deploying obsolete technology. Other countries do allow you to upgrade uh, your technology during those, let us say, five years. And one of the points that we are pushing at national level and EU level is that governments should give flexibility here uh, so that when the wind farm is finally built, it can be built with today's technology. Uh, Christopher, your question. Yep, uh, your maths is absolutely spot on. You get to 39 gigawatts a year that we would need to build in the second half of this decade. New wind, we're currently doing uh, 15 something. Uh, radical does need to change. Um, your point on public opinion, as I said earlier, the opinion polls tell us that those already living close to wind farms have an even higher level of support for the expansion of onshore wind than the general public, so 75% plus. The problem is that those who don't want new wind farms are now extremely well organized, mobilized, and I am afraid, funded. Yes? And they pay for the very best lawyers. Every new permit application for an onshore wind farm in Germany um, gets challenged in the courts. And we often win, of course, but that's at, that adds to costs and uh, incurs delays. Uh, what is the radical thing that needs to happen? Um, the one or two things you can do in the Fit for 55 package, but I think more than anything, it's a change in the uh, mindset and dynamic at government level, at all levels of government, national, regional, and, and local, on not just the importance of doing this, um, but that this has economic value and that communities can benefit as well. Communities are already benefiting. Nearly every onshore wind farm in Europe is paying taxes to the local town hall. Not many people know that, yeah? Often those taxes are 10% of the total budget of that town hall, sometimes much more. Now we have a job to do communicating that so people understand the benefits. There are other things you can do with communities, give them the chance to take a financial stake uh, in, in their local renewables uh, uh, facility. That happens in Flanders, as you know, Ronnie, it happens in Ireland, in, in Scotland, and elsewhere. It doesn't always work, but it often uh, can do. But communities need to understand how they're benefiting uh, uh, economically and socially from the expansion of renewables. Something needs to change radically in the uh, relationship the European Commission has with the 27 individual member states. Um, it's a bit too hands off today. Uh, okay, we've we've proposed some legislation. It's been agreed uh, in co-decision. You've got legal obligations now. We'll write to you uh, in a few years um, uh, to see how you're getting on. And if you're not complying, then you know possible infraction proceedings. Now I'm characterising somewhat. It's already a bit more dynamic and proactive than that. But it needs to be super proactive. Uh, it needs to be in your face and in your face in a very nice and positive way, not naming and shaming, but praising and elevating and actively disseminating good practice, like on the simplification of permitting rules and procedures and really helping member states to get things right. Because there is appetite out there uh, at a national level, especially on permitting. Uh, there's just a lack of knowledge about what works and, and what doesn't. Um, one specific thing in Fit for 55, um, that needs to be got right is the rules on PPAs and guarantees of origin. So the Renewables Directive already says 
you must remove barriers to corporate PPAs. But then another bit of the Renewables Directive allows member states to have barriers because it allows them to withhold guarantees of origin from certain wind and solar facilities that are getting public financial support. That's a very bad loophole that has to go uh, in the new Renewables Directive because we've got to help this transition to be demand driven. As I said earlier, it's much easier to make investments happen if you can see it's being pulled on the demand side. You mobilize the investor community, yeah? And people are more ready to take risks, including delays in permitting, if they can see that there's real appetite on the demand side. And final question, Chris, I'm talking about the tax that consumers pay on their energy consumption, on their final energy consumption, yeah? Not that necessarily the res charges in their energy bills, it's the actual uh, tax that they're paying, which is higher per unit of energy consumption for electricity than it is for gas, and that's got to change. Thank you, Charles. As we are closing down, so uh, uh, Ronnie, you have a minute now, so that I could give you not more because then we would need to conclude. Ronnie, you are muted. Uh, Ronnie, Ronnie, you are muted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's very intriguing, very stimulating, uh, very helpful, and. Uh, I think that additionality really has to be very, very well looked at because you better put that wind farm and connect it to the grid than doing anything else. And that's a real message. And the rest is all a waste of very much money. Use it, a wind farm and a PV panel is hooked to the grid so it can be used in the best way. And the rest is always worse. Sorry for engineering, but that's the way it is. For the rest, thank you very much for the for the and getting contact and go ahead. And the next step is, of course, adequacy, timely time time involvement, short time, day day ahead, etc., and all those things, and have the system going on very much targets, including regulation. Yeah, well, what's, what's left for me is a very brief conclusion. So I think uh, Christopher was very precise. What we heard today, it's encouraging and worrying because it's definitely an enormous chance, as everybody says, this transition is a chance. But it's also clear that things can't be done exactly as we have done them until now. And uh, the first uh, suggestion that I would say for Ronnie actually is to consider writing a book, Energy Transition, what should be done radically differently? Because I think a lot of stuff, what we have thought that we have a know-how how to deal, it should be done differently. I also believe that uh, well, Commission would perhaps will be good advice, but from what I heard today, that it would make a... 2035, for example, as a year by which there should be carbon, uh, zero carbon emissions in the grid. So how it is done, renewables or nuclear in some countries, or perhaps CCS with some offsetting, I think it would be well advised because it's inevitable that you need to do this. And Austria is a good example. Uh, okay, you can always argue they have 70% uh, as 100 is not so far away, but it is challenging. Exactly the last part is, is not such a simple thing. And 10 years, so yeah, okay, others could do five years more. So, so I think it makes sense and it will be somehow focusing the energies where to go. And then the last conclusion I believe that is, uh, is really crucial is this human capital. Um, uh, Francisco, you made an example of your friend. So I could make my own example. I struggling exactly the same issue as your friend. I still have not given up to go to, to the gas boiler because from what I know, it's complete nonsense. But still, all the preconditions are that I go only in this direction. I have no real other options because of a lot of complexities related to go to the heat pump and, and solar. And I have a territory, I have everything there, and still it's really a struggle. And, uh, and that needs to be done radically differently. Also, what just as a permitting procedures, we know we have not such a much of options, especially wind, 
is 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 a crucial option at least for the part that I live. Uh, with due respect to solar PV, we need to take a by far bigger role in in country. I know we have fifty percent of renewables, but we could easily go for wind if we would like to sort out these permitting procedures and also a bit to work with public opinion. And for public opinion, I believe there is also something that should be done radically differently. I don't know other countries so well, but in Latvia, we have very interesting news structure. First of all, it's general news, and then they put a cultural news, and then there is sport news. And I would love that now with all the ambitions that we would have, well, general news, you've, there is a lot of things happening, then climate news. Then the cultural news, okay, cultural news, climate news, for me, it does not matter which one this comes first, then, then comes sports, and then weather. Because, okay, people tend to look at the news to know what is the weather forecast for the next days. But that's, again, it's, it's, it's completely different how you do things. It's not just one-off, but it's permanently to be with this issue. So I think that's, um, now we should thank Roni very much for addressing this issue uh, in his uh, publication. We should also uh, need to thank also Piero, uh, Piero uh, who definitely has uh, invested, uh, Piero Carlo dos Reis, I mean, uh, who invested also a lot of this publication. And I believe this works needs to be continued. And I'm very great, grateful to Giles Dixon and uh, uh, Francisco um, Boschel for joining us and uh, discussing this very, very interesting issues. I know Fit for 55 comes in a week, but it's not the last uh, legislative package that will come. And I know that commission with all the ambition can't answer all the questions, but we could advise it to be as ambitious as they can at this stage, where they believe this is the right thing to propose, they should propose, because later on, the legislative process usually not necessarily improves the ambitions that commission has proposed. So thank you very much. And uh, I wish everybody a very nice summer. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Thank you.